American Mahjong players have been eagerly awaiting the 2020 National Mahjong League card. In this video, I'm going to present my analysis of the new card and share some tips for a smooth transition. If you're new to Mahjong, or if you already know how to play and just want to build your skills, consider subscribing to my channel. That way you won't miss anything. I would describe this card in one word. Extraordinary. I have a lot to share, so I'm going to be reading from these slides. That way I won't miss anything. The National Mahjong League releases their card of valid hands every April. The rules of the game rarely change. If the National Mahjong League modifies a guideline or maybe even changes a rule or adds a rule, players will be notified in the annual bulletin which is sent in January. You will receive that bulletin if you purchase the card through the National Mahjong League website or if you purchase your card through a fundraising organization, they will have had to submit your name and email address to the league. Also, any changes to the guidelines or rules will be written in the booklet Mahjong Made Easy, which can be purchased from their website. On the card, the league uses the same methods to describe the hands letters, numbers, colors, and formats being shapes and patterns of the hands. They stay the same year after year. The categories typically stay the same. This year, the league gave us a surprise. The changes are in the shapes and patterns of the hands. Here are some statistics and findings that I hope can give you some insight into the nuances of this year's card. I also will be giving some tips for a smooth transition at the end. Let's get to the analysis. When I get my new card, I do a side-by-side -side comparison with last year's card. I look at several variables and I count hands so that I can compare the changes by percentages. That way I have a good idea of how those changes are going to affect strategies for the year. As I share the next four slides of statistics, I'm just going to share the statistics themselves with a little bit of commentary. After I share statistics, I'm going to share my findings based on the statistics. So bear with me as we look at a whole bunch of numbers. It'll all make sense when we get to the findings. When I count the hands, I count the variations as separate hands. For example, evens number five has two options, so I count those separately. Here's an analysis by category. You can see that I have this year's counts and last year's counts side by side with a delta or difference to the left. Odds has the highest number of hands, just by one, followed by consecutive run, then evens, wins and dragons, 369, singles and pairs, quints, the year, like numbers, and finally, math play. This is in descending order, so since the addition category is not on the card, it's at the bottom. Last year, there were six hands, and we'll get to that later in the presentation. Here, I looked at values. There were nominal changes, except for one. The big hand on the card is 85 points. In this analysis, I compared attributes. Attributes are variables that impact decision making. Decision making is unique by player, but there are some variables 
every year that are pretty consistent. And these are the ones that I look at from year to year. The top count in this list of attributes is number of hands with pungs, kongs, and quids, 89%. The number of hands in mixed suits, number tiles with or without dragons is next, 61%. Number of hands with like numbers is next, 45%. Number of hands with flowers, 44%. Number of hands in one suit, number of tiles again, with or without dragons, but excluding winds, because winds is one color, but it's not really a suit, 34%. Number of hands with pairs of flowers, 27%. Number of hands with dragons, 22%. Number of hands that are concealed, did I skip a line? 25%. Okay, so dragons, 25%. Number of hands concealed, 22%. Number of hands with singles, 20%. Number of hands with wins, 17%. Number of hands with kongs of flowers, 13%. Number of hands carried over, 9%. Number of hands with quince of flowers, 5%. Number of hands with news, 3%. The variables in this comparison are recurring and prevalent shapes. The shapes of the hands vary widely. So the list is lengthy because we're comparing last year's card with this year's card. I took the top 5%. If you're interested in the full list, send me an email, which you can find in the video description below. Let's look at the top 5%. The most prevalent is pair, pair, pung, pung, kong. I call this deep ascending. It's like a deep stair step. Followed by pung, kong, pung, kong, 6%. Next, we have triple Kong and singles. This is math play, which this year is multiplication, 6%. Next, we have Kong, triple pair, Kong. I call this a gate hand because the Kong's on the end, bracket, the pairs in the middle, 6%. Next, we have triple pung, or no, pung, pung, kong, kong. Pung, pung, kong, kong, 6%. Next we have pair, triple kong, 5%. Pair, kong, year, kong, 5%. We have next quint, kong, quint, 5%. And kong, single pair, Pung, Kong. This is also an ascending shape. We've got a Kong to start, and then it dips down and ascends from there. Now that I've shared the statistics from my comparisons, we're going to look at my findings based on those statistics, because this is what is going to change the decision making for the year. The hand value is the first finding that I want to mention. There are nominal changes with one exception, the big year hand. In the big year hand, you need to have a Kong of white dragons. That's going to be very challenging. White dragons are challenging year to year regardless because there are only three dragons and many hands with dragons. So if you play the big year hand and you get those four dragons, you deserve that 85 points. Plus, you need to have news and two pairs of twos. Let's talk about the carryover hands. The first is evens category has two, number three and number seven. Like numbers, number one. Winds and Dragons has one, that would be number eight. 
the concealed hand. 369 has two, number five and number six. Let's talk about those significant percentages. The highest percentage of hands has pungs, kongs, and quints, 89%, which is close to what it was last year. Really, every year, I think this is going to be the highest percentage because American Mahjong is a game of multiples. If you leverage your multiples, you're going to have a higher win rate, in my opinion. Build around multiples. Gather supporting tiles. Not only is this a strong strategy, but you can claim discards for punks, kongs, and quints. The next significant percentage was with mixed suits, and this is with or without dragons. 61% of the hands have mixed suits. If you are playing in mixed suits, hold on to the opposite dragons because you may be able to use them. The next significant percentage is in the odds category, which has 17% of the hands. While there are more options in this category, the hands are not as flexible as those in the consecutive run category, and the consecutive run category has only one less hand. These are some noteworthy increases. There's an increase in like numbers, six additional hands, primarily because of twos with the year block. Passing like numbers is going to be very risky, especially twos, and it's just as risky as passing a pair, in my opinion. There's an increase with quints, three additional quints. One of the quints has an option in the quint category, but there are two outside the quint category, and those would be the quints with five flowers. Year number four and like numbers number three. If you play quints, make sure that you secure your pairs before you claim the first discard. The next noteworthy increase is news. There are two hands with news on the card this year. If you are not going to use wins and you want to pass them, try to pass one at a time. If you have more than one to pass, count the cost because if somebody is playing a news hand, you could feed right into their hand. The decision is situational though. If you know your hand, you have no gaps or you're close to a winning hand, it may be worth the risk. The next finding is with shapes. There are 26 shapes on this year's card. One less than last year, but they're more dispersed. Before you claim a discard to make an exposure, check the card and compare it to the tiles in your hand to be sure that you're creating the correct shape on every exposure, at least at the beginning of the year. Once you get used to it, it'll be easier. Let's talk about the patterns. Ascending hands are back. That would be where you start small and you ascend into bigger multiples. For example, with evens number one. Gate hands are back. Examples of gate hands would be in odds number four and five. This is where you have kongs on the end with pairs in the middle. Next, we have addition hands. They're off the card. Instead, for math play, we have multiplication tucked into evens and odds. Evens number five, odds number two, two options each. No knitted hands this year. Let's talk about hot commodities. First, flowers. Really, flowers are hot commodities every year, I think. There are fewer 
hands with flowers. 44% of the hands have flowers, but the blocks are bigger. We have fewer Kongs, but we have three quints of flowers. They are going to be hot. Year tiles are going to be a hot commodity. This year, twos are going to be highly sought after because they're required in all year blocks and all but one even hand uses twos, at least one. If you pass twos, try to pass only one at a time. Same as white dragons, try to pass one at a time, if at all. This is future me. As I was editing this video, I had an epiphany about twos on the card this year. Since twos are going to be a hot commodity, consider avoiding them when playing certain hands on the card. For example, in quince, number two and number four, if you do not have your pair secured, start your consecutive run at three. This can apply to all but the first hands in consecutive run and singles and pairs, number two and three. Also consider not using twos in like numbers, number three, and winds and dragons, number four, east and west with evens. Now, if you have your pairs secured, no worries, play it out. But if you don't, pick a different number. Obtaining twos will be very challenging for all hands in the evens category. Be mindful of twos on the table and absent from the table, especially if you're playing a hand with singles and pairs of twos. Dragons are going to be hot commodities, and I think that's true for every year because there are only three dragons. There are fewer hands. Only 27% of the hands on the card use dragons. That's three less from last year. But the dragons are still a hot commodity because of the year blocks. Also, they're in every category on the card. Three categories have one dragon hand, like numbers, quince, and 369. All the others have two or three dragon hands. Dragons, year tiles, and flowers. Hot commodities. I wanted to share an interesting tidbit. There are nine hands on the card this year from the 2002 card. Evens, five and six. Consecutive run number eight. Wins and dragons number two. Three, six, nine, number two. And singles and pairs, four. One, three, five, seven. Interesting coincidence. Let's talk about fatal errors. All number tiles are exposable as pungs. There are some pungs that are not. First, a pung of dragons. Consecutive run number seven is the only hand with a pung of dragons and it is concealed. That's gonna be tricky because last year we were able to make an exposure of a pung of dragons. A pung of north or south. In Winds and Dragons number one and number five, we have exposable pungs of east and west. The only other pungs of winds are in Winds and Dragons number seven and it is concealed. You can make a fatal error with number tiles because every number tile can be used as a single. Count the cost of discarding the fourth number tile in the end game. Let's talk about the potentially problematic parentheticals on this year's card. The first is quint number one. The card shows 
two colors. Flowers are blue. The quint for the number tile is in green, but you can use any dragon and any number will be valid. The next is consecutive run number two. They use the words any run. Any run is synonymous with any three consecutive numbers. Consecutive run number seven. Opposite dragons means that all three suits must be represented. Any three consecutive numbers with the corresponding dragons for the other two suits. That would be a run with opposite dragons. Let's talk about tandem categories. These are categories that share tiles which allow playability to a decision point. The first is the year category. You will be able to tandem with wins and dragons evens and like numbers because both wins and dragons are used and twos are used. For evens, you can tandem with consecutive run if you fill in the gaps. Two, four, six, eight could fill in with three, five, and seven or nine. Like numbers can tandem with any category. There are like numbers all over this card. Next we have quints. You can tandem with consecutive run and like numbers. There are two consecutive run hands in quints and there's one like number hand. For consecutive run, you can tandem with evens and odds if you omit tiles. So for evens, if you're playing one, two, three, four. You could just omit the one and the three and have two, four if you start getting six, eight. And the same could apply to odds. For odds, you can tandem with like numbers and consecutive run with fillers, just like with evens. So if you have one, three, five, but you start getting twos and fours, you can tandem with consecutive run. Wins and dragons can tandem with the year and like numbers. There are wins and dragons in every hand and there are both year tiles in the wind and dragon category and there's a wind hand in the year category. Also there are two, consec or two like number hands in the wins and dragons category. For 369, you can tandem with odds using threes and nines. That's true every year. Singles and pairs can tandem with every category on the card except quints. Primarily because you're going from singles and pairs up to quints, which is a huge jump. So I don't think it tandems very well. It takes a while to build from a single or a pair up to a quint. Now I want to talk about some changes to the fine print on the back of the card. Panel 1. Protocol for Jokers. This is about a third of the way down on panel 1. Jokers may be declared at any time during the game and may be named either Joker, the same as the previous tile, or just called Same. Jokers may be used to replace any tiles in any Pung, Kong, quint or sextet, but may never be used in place of a single tile or any part of a pair. Joker or jokers may be replaced in any exposure with the like tile or tiles by any player, whether picked from the wall or in a player's hand, when it is the player's turn. A player's turn begins when they either pick or claim a tile. So picking from the wall or claiming a tile marks the beginning of a player's turn per the league. Some argue that the discard should be obtained and placed on the top of the rack to mark the player's turn. But the fine print here says 
a player's turn begins when they either pick or claim a tile. The next change is with simultaneous claims and declarations. This is the numbered list one through five on the first panel. Number one hasn't changed. No picking or looking ahead. Number two, when two players want the same discard, one player for an exposure and another for Mahjong, Mahjong Declare always has preference, even if callers' tiles have been exposed. So if a player beginning to declare Mahjong doesn't quite get the words out and another player exposes tiles, the Mahjong Declare gets the tile. Numbers three and four are similar. When two players want the same tile for exposure, player next in turn, two discarder has preference, except when other caller has begun to expose tiles. The next one says, when two players want the same tile for Mahjong, player next in turn to discarder has preference, except when other caller has begun to expose tiles. So this is with a simultaneous call for a tile where they both went it for an exposure. Next in turn gets the tiles, but if another player calls at the same time but also exposes tiles, they get that tile. Next in line does not get the tile. And that same rule applies to two players declaring Mahjong on the same discard. Two players declare Mahjong, but one, after next in turn, exposes tiles first, they get the tile, not the player next in turn. These are highly controversial because some believe that they encourage aggressive play. Some players don't mind those rules because they're advanced players and they already play fast, so it typically doesn't even come into the game. And if it does, then the understanding is already there and it's fine by them. But there are some players who are not able-minded or bodied and are not as quick to respond. These two rules can hurt them. So some, pl some groups have decided to ignore those two rules and make a house rule where next in line gets the discard regardless of whether or not the player after them has begun to expose tiles. So make sure that whatever group you're playing with has told you the house rules so that you know what to expect for simultaneous claims and declarations. Panel two, miscalled tile. A tile cannot be claimed until correctly named. The correctly named tile may then be called for an exposure. However, if Mahjong is called with the incorrectly named tile, the game ceases and Miss Caller pays claimant four times the value of the hand. Others do not pay. If an exposure is made with an incorrectly named tile, the hand is dead. So let's talk about disqualifications. And that's what I'm gonna call it going forward. Disqualified hand. A hand is considered to be disqualified when it is either has either too few or too many tiles or contains an incorrect exposure. The player's who hand has been declared disqualified, ceases to pick and discard, but pays the winner the same as other players. Future me again. As I was editing this part of the video, I remembered that the National Mahjong League posted a new rule late last year in regards to contested disqualifications. That new rule is in the 2020 edition of Mahjong Made Easy. If you don't already have it, I highly recommend that you purchase it from the National Mahjong League website. On page 22, number 23, reads this rule. If a player declares another player's hand disqualified, and that
player whose hand has been called disqualified disagrees, at the end of the game, the challenge is resolved. Whichever player was incorrect at the time of the challenge pays the other player 50 points or cents. These are reasons why a player can be disqualified. No such hand, unwinnable hand, exposing tiles while playing a concealed hand, too few or too many tiles, and picking it out of turn. Pushing out the wrong wall. Picking from the wrong wall. Pages 21 and 22 of Mahjong Made Easy. So that did not make it onto the back of the card, probably due to real estate. There's not a whole lot of space on the back of the card, but that is a new rule. Here's the protocol for claiming a discard. To claim a discard, a player must verbalize their call, alerting other players that a claim is being made. The caller may say, call, take, I want that, etc. Mahjong in error. This is a three-point list. Number one, this has not changed. If a play player declares Mahjong in error and does not expose the hand and all other hands are intact, play continues without penalty. This has changed, number two. Number three has not changed. Number two reads, if a player declares Mahjong in error and exposes part or all of the hand and all other hands are intact, game continues, but declares hand is disqualified. The same penalty applies for calling a discard and making an incorrect exposure. If disqualified hand discontinues playing and does not pick or discard, but must pay a, any subsequent winner the full value of the hand. There are the changes to the fine print on the back of the card. Let's talk about the top three mistakes. Number one, passing risky tiles in the Charleston. Flowers, dragons, like numbers, and twos are all risky tiles. Hold them until the pick and discard phase of the game when you can discard them or pass them individually. Number two, claiming a discard for an exposure when you're playing a concealed hand. Always check for the X and C before you claim your first discard, or you might have to do some fancy footwork to change your hand. Now I wanna share some tips for a smooth transition. The first is to do hands-on exercises if you have a set of tiles at home. If you don't have a set of tiles at home, look for a link in the video description below. I recommend the White Swan set sold by Gammon Village in the soft case. Easy to transport, the tiles are beautiful, and I wrote the book that comes with the set. And it follows all my American Mahjong lessons. The first exercise is called category modeling. This is where you have all the tiles right side up on the table. You have your card in front of you and you create each hand on the card. Modify the hand based on the text in the parentheses because those parentheses are gonna give you both limitation and flexibility. Next is Charleston modeling. This is where you add a mock Charleston to a randomly dealt hand. So you're going to turn all the tiles upside down, mix them up, 
deal yourself 13 or 14 tiles and then create a mock Charleston. Look at your dealt hand, make a plan, pick three tiles to pass, and then bring in your first pass from your mock Charleston. This will help you improve your decision making. The next exercise is called Charleston Chain Reaction. This is a great way to test your instincts. It's a variation of Charleston modeling. So you're going to create a mock Charleston and you're going to deal a random hand and then you're going to make decisions based on the strength of the hand. Sometimes though, you can go multiple directions. So you're going to go through the Charleston with one direction in mind and then recreate both the mock Charleston and the hand and then pick a different direction and compare results. The next exercise is called Charleston Sprints. This is where you train yourself to make quicker and quicker decisions. It's another variation of Charleston modeling. You're going to create a mock Charleston and a dealt hand and then you're going to set a threshold for you to make starting let's say with four minutes since we're we have a new card push yourself to make quick decisions under four minutes and then lower the threshold to three minutes eventually get to two minutes then you'll be ready to play at a seven or eight second table at mahjong time next is charleston force this is where you practice playing for a prize because at tournaments they'll pre-select categories or even hands. If you make that hand, you could win a prize. Also, some players like to do something called the dot challenge. You basically mark each hand on the card with a dot. So sometimes you might force a hand because you want to win every hand on the card. Charleston Force. It's a great way to play something that you might not normally play. Finally, we have solitaire. This is where you play four hands at one time. You're going to play as each player. The key is that you have to compartmentalize your decision making. You've got to pretend like you don't know what is in the other player's hands as you make decisions one player at a time. It's a great way to practice decision making during the pick and discard phase of the game. I have videos on all of these exercises. There'll be links in the video description below. Next, play live often. Play with both a peer group so that you can relax and have fun, but also play with an advanced group so that you can push yourself. It's a great opportunity to observe more experienced players. There's much that can be learned through observation. Play online between games. I like to play at Mahjong time. I think it is the best platform for online Mahjong. Primarily because the support team is very responsive and open to ideas from the player base. The interface is realistic. The community is friendly and healthy. Also, they host marathons and tournaments. So it's another great way to push yourself as a player. If you have not played there yet, or if you haven't had that VIP trial in the past, look for my email in the video description below and I can send you some information. Finally, watch my videos. I have a playlist called American Mahjong Lesson Strategy. In here are lots of core strategies that can help you improve as a player. Also, look for strategy theory. This is where I play online at Mahjong time and I give commentary as I play a game. So you hear my thought process throughout the game. Now I want to share with you some Facebook groups if you use social media. And if you don't, I encourage you to give it a try or go back to it if you've left. The first group is Mahjong That's It. This is the largest Facebook group of Mahjong enthusiasts. I believe at the time of this filming, there are 25,000 plus members. That's a lot of Mahjong content in that Facebook group. 
If you play Siamese Mahjong, consider joining the Siamese Mahjong Guild. If you are looking for a group or a instructor, consider joining Mahjong Community because they have some resources that can help you get connected. Consider joining my Facebook group. Here I post events for when I go live or when I travel. Also, I post links to all my videos that I publish on YouTube. I hope that the information I shared in this presentation gave you an insight into the new card and helps you with a smooth transition. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, consider subscribing. Click that little gray bell if you do. That way you'll get notification for when I post new videos and you won't miss an opportunity to learn a new strategy or pick up an insight to the game that could give you an advantage at the table. Between now and the next video, may all your picks be keepers. Thank you.